leads us into that conversation about poultry farming and the journey me this afternoon. I'm delighted to be hosting Thomas Kaundia. He wears several hats. Allow me to call him as a poultry expert. We also have with us Victor Yamo, who is from the Wild Animal Protection. Thank you, gentlemen, for making time to speak to us this afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Let me just start off with uh, Thomas. <clears throat> poultry farming is considered as an easy shortcut by many Kenyans in the eventuality that um, they want to get into business. If you go to the countryside, many people keep chicken. Um, in Nairobi, we'll get pockets of people in different neighborhoods um, rearing the chicken. But not everyone is doing it in a profitable way or a humane way, <laughs> as Dr. Yamo put it earlier. Yeah. So really, talk to us about uh, poultry farming. Has it been evolving in the right fashion? And are we seeing people making good money out of it? Or is it just a big companies, the Kenchiks of this world, and the other companies? I think that is the wrong notion that many people have, that poultry is a, a business or a farming system where you go in and make your money and possibly come out. Poultry is intricate and very sensitive, and the farmer must plan accordingly to be able to be successful. First, the farmer must have a budget. How much money do you want to make out of poultry? So that you, just, you don't just go into it blindly. Mm -hmm. And then after that, the farmer must know the prices of inputs and of course the output, how the market is functioning. And the farmer must also know the number of chicken that they can rear to break even. Otherwise, if it cannot break even, it cannot continue. And mm -hmm. that has happened with very many farmers. And therefore, as uh, the chair of the World Poultry Science Association, we've taken upon ourselves to make sure that we disseminate the right information that the farmer can use sure. to do it sustainably. Sustainability. Sustainability is very important. I Consequently, uh, we have a tool, a profitability analysis tool, that once you know the cost of inputs and yes. outputs... We'll get into that. Exactly. Hold your horses. Yes. And um, let me bring in Dr. Yamo. Yeah. Of course, uh, you've seen also chicken or poultry farming in, uh, in its generality. Mm. It has been a strong revenue generator. Yeah. for people who have been doing it in the right way. True. Of course, there are questions around the humane aspects mm -hmm. around it. And perhaps talk to us about these issues mm -hmm. as also we look at the bigger picture of how can we improve productivity yeah. and profitability. I think uh, another very good question, Abby. And where I'd like to start is to say that just like humans have rights, animals generally have what we call fundamental freedoms. And there's actually a process worldwide to have a universal declaration on animal welfare, which is essentially would be equivalent to human rights as we know them. Mm -hmm. There are basically five fundamental freedoms, which are very important, and which if a farmer looks after, would have a better, they would end up with better improved, product, improved productivity of the flocks that they are keeping. The first uh, fundamental freedom says that animals have a right to access food and water. And one of the things we've observed over the years is that when uh, animals are not fed well and watered well, we end up in a situation where they are not able to produce because productivity depends on how much you feed, the right quality of feed, and good quality feed. Very important. In fact, I would even want to say that in the Kenyan laws, uh, Prevention of Cruelty Act, it's actually illegal to underfeed an animal, to starve oh, it, really? or not even to provide it with water. I didn't know Those that. are some of the things that Kenyans do not know. So part of uh, my experience in the industry, working with Tom and a, a few other people, is that if farmers don't do the right thing, sometimes they are not aware that that has a negative impact on their business. Mm -hmm. The second freedom is the freedom f from discomfort, which is essentially talking about the environment in which we put this animal, the kind of housing. Is it a good quality house? Does it have good ventilation? Does it have enrichment, which is now what something that we are trying to get Kenyan farmers to understand that it's not just about giving the animal a good house, but also about how much litter does it have for the animal to be able to perform its natural uh, behaviors. Yeah? How well is their house ventilated so that it's able to get a, carry off uh, 
the ammonia that usually happens in the chicken house, mm -hmm. and that then minimizes diseases. And that brings me to the third fundamental right, which is a freedom, which is the freedom for the animal to be free from pain, injury, or disease. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges we've had in the poultry industry, where I've worked for the last 20 years, is the fact that chickens get sick, one, because the environment is not good, which then predisposes them to disease. For instance, if you have a lot of ammonia in the house because of poor ventilation, the animal ends up with a respiratory uh, condition. Yeah? If they are overcrowded, the animal ends up fighting each other and leading to injuries, which then downgrades the product when it goes to the, to the, to the processing plant. The next freedom is uh, freedom from, to exp to freedom to exhibit natural behaviors. Mm. And basically, chickens traditionally or naturally have a certain behavior. Chickens are supposed to scratch. They're supposed to be able to sand, dust bathe the, the way they, uh, they forage. They're supposed to be able to patch. In our production systems, our houses do not have those capacities that allow chickens to do what they are naturally supposed to do. So for instance, you should have enough man, uh, litter in the chicken house, dry, friable litter, which allows the chicken to be, to, to be able to rest on it and to be able to scratch and to also to be able to lie on it. Uh -huh. And the last one is the freedom from distress and fear, which is basically an animal which is stressed or fearful is not going to be able to perform. And such an animal, if slaughtered, and Tom can talk more about this because he's running processed, uh, processed plants. Mm -hmm. If an animal is slaughtered because it, when it's stressed, the meat quality and the texture changes and that leads to a poor wow. quality product. Wow. So you see those fundamental freedoms are actually geared towards improving the farmer's productivity, but making how, the uh, business sustainable, but right. it also caters for the welfare of the animal. So the two are actually closely linked. Wow. Yeah. I think uh, many Kenyans, including myself, yeah. these are very new things to me. Yeah. And uh, I'm just keen to find out how is the compliance rate if you are to rate us as a country? <laughs> as an organization, we actually work globally. So we've done what is called an API, an animal, product, animal Protection Index, which you can Google and look at. Kenya is one of the countries we've rated, and the index actually looks at the laws that we have, the policies that we have, and how they uh, impact on animal welfare. Unfortunately, we've not done very well. The act that I've just talked about, Prevention, of Protection, Prevention of Cruelty Act, Cap 360, Act, yes. is a 1962 piece of legislation. And it's interesting that a good proportion of Kenyans are not aware of it. Wow. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Secondly, we are still in the process of developing policies. We had a change in the constitution in 2010. The new constitution, which is now no longer new, having been around for about seven years, brought in certain aspects. For instance, under the national government, national government is mm -hmm. supposed to provide the policy environment that enables uh, some of these things to be done. In fact, uh, under the separation of duties, Article 22, uh, under that uh, Schedule 4, talks about national governments ensuring sustainable f uh, sort of form of governance mm -hmm. that, leads to, that leads to protection of animals and wildlife. All right. Yeah? Which is one of the things that we are now looking at, because now it's a constitutional Interesting. requirement. Interesting. The veterinary policy also addresses some of these things, and veterinary policy is in the process of being developed. I think the last I heard of it, it has just gone through Treasury to confirm that it can be funded and it should be ratified sooner than later. All right. But in terms of laws, we are now re-looking at the whole law system, the whole legal system, and that's one of the things as a wild animal protection we look at. How do we ensure that we have legal compliance or the laws work for the farmer and for the animal? Indeed. And that is very important because part of doing international trade requires that we have trade-sensitive laws that conform to what World Trade Organization uh, would require. Yes, WTO. And, yeah, and World Trade Organization has appointed World Organization for Animal Health to be the people who drive trade around livestock products. Okay. And so in that context, we need to be looking at how we are going to look at uh, to, to ensure that we generate the right laws. We are now reviewing uh, CAP 360 to ensure that it conforms to national standards. Counties have started developing animal welfare laws and animal care laws because uh, same schedule for also gives them responsibility on animal husbandry, gives them responsibility on care and welfare of animals. Okay. So that's right. also being done. So in Quite Nairobi, a lot in the pipeline. Yeah. yeah. So in I Nairobi, agree. for instance, they've developed a bill which mm -hmm. talks about where you can keep animals. Yes, I, I actually interacted, yeah, interacted with that bill. Yeah. 
And I think, um, Thomas, all these are geared towards um, improving productivity. But how practical are they? They are actually practical. What farmers need to do is walk into a government office and say they want rare poultry. Mm -hmm. They will get all the leaflets they need in terms of housing design, yep. the regulations which are there. But this is the bit that some farmers actually do neglect. Mm -hmm. And in the process, you find that performance is not the way it should be. It should be. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it would be prudent that farmers visit uh, government offices and they get the relevant information and poultry farming will definitely be profitable. And uh, from where you sit as the World Council on uh, poultry issues, um, as a country, of course, agriculture remains one of the top revenue earners for mm -hmm. the government yeah. and yeah. also employs a big chunk of yeah. people and it has a potential to further employ more people. Yeah. From the standpoint of where you are, looking at poultry farming, what do we need to do to take us to the next level in terms of improving yields, improving uh, the output, and also quality? I think from where I, I sit, what, what is lacking is compatibility along the poultry value chain. That means that farmers sometimes rear poultry in excess and they don't have where to keep it. Most of the farmers, when they slaughter their chicken at home and then they go with it to the market still wet and dripping and that means the chicken is already spoiling. And therefore we need that along the poultry value chain there are facilities or the farmers are facilitated such that when they add value, that is they slaughter the chicken humanely they have a place where it can be cooled and chilled before actually it goes to the market. Mm -hmm. At the moment, what is happening and what is making farmers lose is that they go with this chicken and but they the know peasant, it is But the peasant farmer cannot afford all this. Or they can come together as a group mm -hmm. and then they will be able to access such a facility, either through some funding or through some credit facility. Mm -hmm. I know of banks which are willing to actually fund farmers and there have been so many NGOs as well that have done so. So as an individual, that would be very difficult. But when they work together, mm -hmm. then they will be able to capture any market that they will need. Interesting. Yes. Maybe just to add something, I'll be mm -hmm. uh, beyond, uh, I think the other thing that the poultry, poultry industry needs to do is to uh, develop standards. What we are lacking in this country is industry standards. And one of the things we are challenging the poultry industry to do is to work with us to develop industry standards in terms of how do we keep this chicken? What are the opportunities? How do, do our production system relate to the international uh, uh, markets? And I think that is becoming very important because realize that the international market is no longer out there. If you are a, a good Kenyan, you know we have KFC already here, mm -hmm. we have Domino's, we have Burger King, and those are the big brands in the, in, in internationally. They have a vigorous uh, production standard that they want farmers to meet. And for me, I think the challenge that I need to ask the Kenya farmer is, can we up our game by looking at the production system, working with the government, mm -hmm. working with the industry to ensure that we are able to uh, operate at the standard which this industry is asking for. Because for instance, if you do not meet those standards, animal welfare standards, production standards, the most likely thing is you open ourselves to be importation of products. Sure. And if you look at KFC, for instance, and this is out in the public domain, they will tell you they do not use potatoes from this country. They import potatoes from Egypt because our potatoes don't meet certain standards. Yes. So that's what we're trying to work with the industry to understand that their animal welfare standards, their standards that they need to be looking at, around the five fundamental rights that I talked about yes. that are critical for them, for any farmer who wants to leverage and operate in the high value market systems. All right. yeah. And uh, gentlemen, as we wrap up the conversation, allow me to give uh, Thomas, uh, what are some of the other aspects that your body has been trying to advocate for in regard to trying to improve the agribusiness climate in the country as you also give your parting shot? Well, World Poultry Science Association is advocating commercial production of chicken to move away from the backyard production system 
to commercial production. And co commercial, under commercial production, of course, uh, the, the quality aspects will come in, uh, the rights of the animal comes in, and the safety of the product. You know, today, uh, organizations would require a due diligence. The chicken you are supplying, where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. How is the standard like? How is the growing like? How, who are the people involved? Do I, are they skilled or they are not skilled? So these have become very, very important. And therefore, uh, our farmers have no choice but to do it the correct way. All right. And World Poultry Science Association will provide all the information which is required, will bring in people to talk to farmers so that it's done the right way. So how can people get you? Oh, uh, people will get me through my phone number. <laughs> people right. will get me through the World right. Poultry Science Association website. Okay. okay. Uh, they will definitely then come to me. All right, because I'm an aspiring poultry farmer. <laughs> Very good. Right. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Yes. And uh, Dr. Tari, also, just uh, in brief, just yeah. uh, give us your closing thoughts on uh, this subject. Okay. I, th I think that's, that I, I talked about the legal and policy environment, but in closing, I want to also say one of the things we do as an organization is to work with consumers, to sensitize consumers so that you understand that there's a link between how the animal was treated when it's growing and what ends up on your table. And for us, that is very important because working ar around 15 other countries, what we've discovered is that consumers are able to drive that process and force industry to uh, conform to certain standards and requirements as so long as the consumers are enlightened. And so as, uh, in conclusion, I would want to say that if you went to our website, World Animal Protection website, you'll find that we run petitions. Right now we are running a petition asking the Kenyan government to... Um, to ratify the national strategy for disaster risk management and one asking for KFC to improve its standards on productions in production systems. The KFC one is a global one because it's more about the outside world where people are already starting to question how is the broiler chicken produced, how is it managed and what impact does it have on health because there are certain things that we need to look at which might has, have a negative impact on health. Right. So that is something we would like you to look at. Follow us on, on our Facebook. We have a, an active Facebook, an active digital platform that you can follow, follow us on because that then helps us to drive the petitions and to get the farmers more aware and the consumers aware on uh, how animal welfare impacts on productivity, on livelihoods and on food security. Fantastic place Thank to end the conversation. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for making time to speak to us. Thank you.